the print of the cuff corporate partner au small finance bank in alliance with indraprastha polo hospitals airline partner spice jet on off the cuff today hussein akani whose name is his best introduction so hussein welcome to off the cuff we would have much rather had this conversation face to face or maybe walking some place but since we can't do it we are far away from each other uh let me start immediately with a question uh based on what you've been saying everywhere because i've seen followed all your interviews lately you keep saying pakistan is not a normal country so why is pakistan not a normal country what's your definition of a normal country and what makes not- it abnormal well thank you very much for having me over uh, uh, shekhar and yes i do miss uh, walking together with you Uh, or talking in person uh, but this is a good second uh, option uh, let me just begin by saying that a normal country is a predictable country uh, even a authoritarian or dictatorial regime is normal in the sense that certain patterns of it can be predicted uh, pakistan is not normal because it's unpredictable uh, it's supposed to be a parliamentary democracy but we already saw uh, uh, that parliamentary norms and procedures are not always followed uh, when it's under military dictatorship our military uh, rulers always try to say but we are very benign we are not like other military rulers um the military has had a long track record of being involved in politics uh, overtly or covertly now when the military says it's neutral even then various political actors insist that it should still play some kind of a role because they can't seem to work things out among themselves and the understanding that people should actually have some norms in dealing with one another just do not apply look at what happened in the last few days the opposition brought a vote of no confidence the g- government which was a coalition government it was not a single party government it lost its coalition partners yes there were defections from the party also but e- without the defectors the opposition still got a majority because the coalition partners went to the other side that in any other parliamentary democracy is perfectly normal the moment your coalition partners leave you you lose a majority you resign imran khan refused to resign what was his solution to the problem it was to say there is a conspiracy against me so the pre- prevalence of conspiracy theories is an other reason why pakistan is no longer a normal country because where else can somebody a prime minister say that 196 members of parliament and here i am including the number of the uh, pti defectors as well but without them 176 was the opposition strength after the defection of the two coalition partners of imran khan that the majority of parliament are conspirators who conspired with a foreign power no trial no former charge sheet no evidence and there are still people in pakistan who are loyal to imran khan who believe that and the supreme court of pakistan which on short order should have said this is absolute nonsense the constitution is very clear the prime minister who has a vote of no confidence pending against him simply cannot dissolve parliament period instead of doing that they have gone into this whole debate about but does the speaker have the right or doesn't he point is how can the speaker have the right to override the constitution when the constitution is very clear and the grounds on which he has done it are based on a conspiracy theory so all these things make the rest of the world feel that pakistan is not a normal country it's sad i want pakistan to be seen and to be a normal country but these things do not let it be seen as a normal country this conspiracy theory how convinced convinced are you about it you live in washington you you live close to the conspiracy capital of the world well let me just say one thing for the last one year it has been very difficult to get anybody of any significance in washington dc to pay any attention to pakistan so to think that when nobody is paying attention to something that's when they will actually be conspiring about it is absolutely absurd to me second 
the allegation that the conspiracy theory to play, uh, is based on is that the assistant secretary of state told the Pakistani ambassador that we don't like Imran Khan and relations will not get better until Imran Khan is removed. Now, that is something diplomats say to each other all the time. The assistant secretary of state in the United States is equal to the rank of joint secretary in India or uh, director general of the foreign office in Pakistan. Above him is under secretary, deputy secretary, and secretary of state. Then, of course, there is the vice president and president. CIA director is also supposed to be very powerful. None of those people could be in, uh, involved to uh, uh, threaten Pakistan. None of those people were involved in trying to uh, make uh, convey to the Pakistani ambassador that we want your prime minister removed. Regime change from America is not going to be as a result of a conversation between the Pakistani ambassador and the assistant secretary. If the assistant secretary tells the Pakistani ambassador, and I have been Pakistan's ambassador to the US, that we don't like your prime minister. And by the way, it's not the first time they've said that. I'm sure they've said that about others in the world. Pakistani diplomats say regularly that there can be no peace between India and Pakistan while the Modi government in, is in office. Does that mean Pakistan is trying to effect regime change in India? It just does not add up. Lastly, even that conversation and its record and the comment on it by Pakistan's National Security uh, Council makes no mention of any cooperation, collaboration or, part, uh, or, or, or joining of hands by the opposition and the Americans. The National Security Council statement simply says that an American official used undiplomatic language and we will protest it. How can undiplomatic language be construed as a conspiracy? If undiplomatic language is to be considered the basis of a conspiracy, then Imran Khan commits conspiracy every day against almost everyone because he uses undiplomatic and indecent language against many people all over the world. Well, I think I think he's been calling Modi Nazi. Uh, that I think is a more commonly used expression, but I think oh. beyond that. Uh, no, no. My point is, bad language is can you can protest bad language, and I don't know what was said. I haven't seen any record of the meeting, but all I know is I have seen the National Security Council statement. That's the Pakistani National Security Council saying that. The Pakistani National Security Council says undiplomatic language was used. I don't know what language was used, but the question is. How is undiplomatic language being used by the American Assistant Secretary of State with the Pakistani ambassador, the proof of a conspiracy? There is and, what I'm really, and what I'm really, really alarmed by is the fact that we have a Supreme Court that creates, first of all, the Chief Justice creates arbitrary benches. So case of this importance, he should have the senior most judges. He ju includes junior judges. And then he prolongs the hearing for three, four days. Now, one theory is that he's doing it so that the PTI can't say that everything was quickly done and there was already cooked up. Possible. But the Supreme Court's only consideration should be the law and the constitution. It should not be all these political factors. And the prime minister, who has lost the majority of parliament, and he lost the majority of parliament the day the opposition showed up with his coalition partners. Yeah, his numbers, the game is over. When your coalition partners leave you, leave you, you resign. He did not resign because he wanted to just say, I can play to the last bar. Now, Shekhar, you and I have many things on which we agree. One thing you and I have never agreed upon is this fascination of many people in the subcontinent with this game of cricket. I find it not a particularly brilliant game. Uh, people totally love it. You guys are totally in America, it. For America for too long. Fair enough. Fair enough. Even if I, by the way, even when I was not in America, the very first time I encountered cricket was test cricket. So I was a little boy and everybody was listening in those days to transistor radios. They were listening to cricket match. So at the end, uh, you know, it went on. I kept asking as a little boy, you know how children are. I kept asking. So Kaun jita, kaun jita. 
वन डे क्रिकेट जब तक आई ऑब्वियसली आई हेड कम टू अमेरिका सो दैट्स अ डिफरेंट मैटर बट माय पॉइंट इज दिस ऑब्सेशन विद क्रिकेट अलाउज इमरान खान टू यूज क्रिकेट एनालॉजी आई विल प्ले टिल द लास्ट बॉल व्हाट लास्ट बॉल बाय पॉलिटिक्स इज नॉट अबाउट लास्ट बॉल्स दिस इज नॉट दिस दे कांट बी द लास्ट बॉल एंड दिस इज नॉट द लास्ट इनिंग्स यू आर प्राइम मिनिस्टर यू लूज यू बिकम लीडर ऑफ अ ऑपोजिशन then there is another election if you win you come back you become prime minister again churchill became leader of opposition many times churchill became prime minister many times in india you have had people who have become leader of opposition prime minister leader of opposition prime minister every parliamentary democracy has that again not following that not normal yeah so there is a difference between this coup if we may call it constitutional coup and other coups and if you look at the history of pakistan all coups have been bloodless immediately bloodless and successful barring one one coup that coup attempt that failed was in 1951 but perhaps that's because that was a coup of the leftists even if some of them were generals this is a, an unusual coup it's a coup by a politician uh well we must remember that even in 1980 even in 1993 when prime minister nawaz sharif was removed by president ghulam isa khan it was seen as a palace coup prime minister nawaz sharif won the uh, case in the supreme court and was restored uh, to office and then two or three months uh, later he was forced to resign along with uh, uh, the president at that time so my point is that it was it is not that every attempt to change things works out exactly as it has played out a coup basically means when the military is behind it so far so far there is no evidence that the military right now is interested in keeping imran khan in office we must also understand we must also understand that if they do they are risking pakistan's relations with the united states and the west the west has come together again after many years of differences among themselves over ukraine japan australia european union the united states canada they are all together for the first time uh, since the cold war in such closeness at a moment like this having a prime minister who is accusing the leading country in the west of conspiring to get him will not be good for pakistan's relations with these countries so letting imran khan be in office means helping him win the next election because he will use the state authority and power he will use pakistan's state television he will use all kinds of government resources to try and win look his reputation for oh, he is not personally corrupt is all has has gone for a six now let me use a cricket analogy because one of his closest associates ha, ha, has exposed his corruption only yesterday mr alim khan uh, he he has just he's just one of those persons who keeps saying i am not corrupt reminds you of richard nixon who used to say i am not a crook uh, anybody who needs to keep saying that obviously has something to hide but he is not past using state machinery and government machinery in the election so if the powers that be really want him to stay on and this is really a coup as you are suggesting then that would not be good for pakistan for that reason no, but if, if on the other hand it's a, if yeah. it's a political coup from him is what are the chances it will be successful armies <laughs> assume that they well, are i think i think that under pakistan's constitution of course there has to be a caretaker government to hold elections the caretaker government has to be agreed upon by the government and the opposition we will see the supreme court give some judgment i am somebody who has learnt after personal experience also having expectations of fair play justice and constitutional uh, judgment from the supreme court of pakistan is often uh, proved wrong the supreme court gave, gives expedient decisions it doesn't give constitutionally rooted and legally rooted decisions in fact that is why no recent judgment of the pakistani supreme court is cited in any court outside of pakistan all the usually supreme court judgments in countries are cited in each other none of them are taught in any law school anywhere in the world it is a sad reflection on the pakistani supreme court and justice bandial could have been the guy who changed that 
let's see if he does. But if the Supreme Court gives one of those expedient judgments, it, it could take two shapes. One could be, well, we can't look into what the speaker said, so therefore we are not uh, going to judge, let things move on. That results in election. The second expedient decision could be, well, what was done was illegal, but since elections have already been called, let's go ahead with elections. The really constitutional uh, uh, judgment, which almost all legal experts in the world seem to agree is the re legal recourse, which is to say the action was illegal, the assembly should be called back, the vote of no confidence should go ahead, and then let the new prime minister, Shabazz Sharif, dissolve parliament and hold elections. That is not looking too likely at this moment. So whichever of those judgments comes, we will end up with an election. And what happens in that election will be critical for what happens in the future. Now, that's the question. It does seem that, Pak that Imran Khan is still quite popular in spite of the fact that I noticed since 2018, since he took over Pakistan's GDP per capita has been declining and it's been declining sharply because there is also the element of population increase. So once you net that with GDP over net GDP, then you can see it's declining sharply. Pakistani rupee has gone into a free fall. All of Pakistan's economic indicators are bad. Uh, Pakistan inflation, inflation is in double digits. It's the highest in a very, very long time. Yeah, and the Pakistan stock market has not gone back to the 2017 level. Uh, yes. uh, in, spite of, in spite of that, is our impression or my impression wrong that Imran Khan continues to be quite popular in his constituency at least? Yeah. Of course, he has a constituency. Uh, you may remember a article I wrote in the print in which I described it as the military middle class. These are people who've gone to military schools. These are people who have grown up in cantonments. These are offspring of military officers. They have been brought up on a narrative. That narrative is a very simplistic narrative. That narrative is Pakistan is a great country, destined for greatness, except for these bad politicians. Uh, uh, Pakistan has bad neighbors. That's Pakistan's curse. There is no discussion of the fact that Pakistan can't manage to increase its exports because it doesn't produce anything that is exportable other than textiles uh, or, or in any significant quantity. That remittances actually have a negative side also. You send the best people of your country abroad to earn dollars to be able to keep your country's foreign exchange reserves afloat. That means the best manpower is not no longer available in Pakistan. General Bajwa, who's trying to steer a middle course, recently said, what is stopping Americans from investing in Pakistan? Well, I'll tell him what is stopping Americans from and Westerners from investing in Pakistan. It is Pakistan's investment climate. People want, as I said, people want predictability. People want courts that do not interfere with normal business. People want courts that uphold contracts. Look at this record X saga. Uh, now there has been a deal with Barrick Gold, but that is not a positive. That's a negative because you've stopped that project for many, many years. Sir, so explain that a little bit for Indian audiences. So, record egg is Pakistan's huge reserve of copper and gold, which was discovered in Balochistan by R E K O D I Q. R E K O D I Q, record dick. Yes. In Balochistan. Balochistan. Now, there was a foreign company that came and did all this, and they found it. Uh, mining for copper and gold requires very high technology. Some people in Pakistan, led by Samar Mubarak Mand, who's a nuclear scientist, used their fame from being part of Pakistan's nuclear program to argue, why do foreigners need to do this? We can do this. And so they got the Supreme Court of Pakistan at that time to cancel the contract of the foreign company, saying that after the reserves had been found, that the contract was originally based on corruption. Well, the company went to the international uh, court for uh, 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 investment disputes, ICSID, of the World Bank, because there was World Bank money involved, and they got a judgment. The judgment was that Pakistan will have to pay a penalty, and that uh, and that penalty was going to be eleven billion dollars. Pakistan kept dragging its feet. Eleven billion, billion. Gigi, eleven billion. That's what I said with a B. That's a lot. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Pakistan, it's a lot. It's a small uh, uh, economy in that sense. It, Eleven billion dollars will be the penalty. Pakistan dragged its feet, went here, there, and in the end, Pakistan has done a deal with the company, the same foreign company, saying, "Okay, please come back." Now, what has happened in the meantime is that all these years, when Pakistan could have been mining that copper, and that goal has been wasted. Why? Bad Supreme Court judgment, backed by the then Pakistani establishment and a uh, and and those who used it as a political slogan. And this is not the only instance. There are so many judgments that have been given against Pakistan because Pakistan has cancelled contracts with foreign companies. That is the reason that international companies do not invest in Pakistan. China invests because its companies are state-owned, and so China is actually investing as a strategic decision. And there too, Pakistanis must be warned: China could do what it has done in Sri Lanka. You have pledged this land to us. You have pledged this port to us. Money is you are not paying us back. Thank you very much. We are taking over that territory, and that is loss of sovereignty. So my point is that this people who have these simplistic views of patriotism, who have a simplistic view of what Pakistan, how Pakistan will reach greatness, do not understand global economics, do not understand international relations. They do support Imran Khan, and they like his narrative. His narrative is very simple: we are a great nation, we are Iqbal Shaheens, God's grace is with us. Uh, I don't know where God's grace was on the 16th of December 1971, but it's with us. Uh, Pakistan was created on the night of Shab-e Qadr in uh, 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 in uh, Ramadan. Uh, it's special. It's blessed. And then there are all these people who come on Pakistani television channels and reinforce that narrative. So, are there people who believe that narrative? Absolutely, and they think Imran Khan is that Iqbal Ka Shaheen. But the point is. are there also people who are worried about inflation who are worried about the fact that everything that they buy and consume is becoming more expensive are there business people who are worried about their exports uh, to european union and to america which are the biggest export markets pakistan's total trade with russia shekhar is 200 million dollars mm. 200 million with the m nothing, nothing. which is nothing and yet imran khan shows up to stand beside putin on the day putin is attacking ukraine and what does he say in front of tv cameras oh what an exciting time like a child very excited about watching a cricket game the fact of the matter is that it had implications which he did not understand what i am told is that the pakistan military leadership warned him not to go and yet he did it So a man like now, are there people in Pakistan who say, "Dekho, Biden ne phone ne kya? Putin to hamare saath hai." You know, yes, but is that logical? Is that going to change Pakistan's future for the better? Please note that even in the middle of all this, the army chief gave a speech in which he said, "The United States is our uh, biggest uh, export market. The European Union is an important." business partner we want good relations with the us and eu now point is if the us is conspiring against pakistan then pakistan's honor requires that pakistan should not want good relations with the us the fact that the army chief is saying that is a signal that imran khan is going too far with this gharat business but there is a gharat constituency in pakistan and that will vote for imran khan uh yeah, bread and butter issues may not suffice now remember in the past the gharat constituency used to be with jamaat e islami in pakistan jamaat e islami got eliminated so we will find out in elections will the bread and butter issues prevail or will the gharat narrative because there is a sense there is a sense and we carried an article today on the print also by a, by a commentator respected commentator of pakistani origin that is huma yusuf and she says that look what choice are the pakistan is being given because they are being told basically to choose between people who are corrupt and people who are not very bright so what do you do that's an absolute fallacy and that is with all due respect to huma yusuf people like her have kept this uh, narrative going for a long time uh, corruption is endemic in south asia 
Uh, it has been endemic for years. Uh, it's a culture that goes back to the British era when the British used to say that the reason why we don't have high uh, salaries for uh, government employees is because whatever you do in India or uh, in the subcontinent, the lower bureaucracy will live off the people. The police wala will take the uh, amrut from the tela for without paying uh, or have a cup of tea without paying. And the higher bureaucracy will live off the state. They will try to divert revenue or try to get kickbacks. It's a sad thing. It needs to be dealt with. But this narrative of politicians is corruption is exaggerated. It has never been conclusively, uh, conclusively uh, settled. The way to deal with it would be like you've done in India. For example, Lalu Parsad Yadav, case was filed, went to prison, got bail, stayed in politics, became a minister, whatever, remained, remained, remained. And then finally was convicted, was sent to jail, and it was a credible punishment. Pakistan has never had that process. So if that process comes, some politicians who are corrupt will be, will be taken out of politics. Now, is Mr. Imran Khan not corrupt? That argument, uh, uh, this business that he's not bright, but he's honest, is wrong. Totally wrong. I have said this earlier. What is Imran Khan's means of income? He hasn't played cricket since, what, 1992? Cricket commentary for a few years? How much money could he have made? Let us have his balance sheet. Let us see his lifestyle. Yes, he got the house through his ex-wife. Fine. But then after that, he's had a pretty comfortable lifestyle. Mr. Jahangir Tareen, Mr. Alim Khan, who have left him now, they have all acknowledged that we used to spend lots of money on him. His ex-wife has written a book, very disturbing book, uh, uh, in which she says even the groceries used to come from outside. How can somebody who has no visible means of income and uh, lives a grand lifestyle of others not actually be presiding over corruption, whether he takes money himself or whether I could very easily be non-corrupt in the sense that I never take any money from anyone. I am a, I'm, I, I can become a sadhu, but I can say that 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 And those people who are spending millions of rupees on him, billions of rupees on him, aren't they doing it in expectation of something? And now there have been suspicion about this Punjab chief minister who was a total nincompoop, he, uh, who, uh, uh, he, uh, about whom the army has been saying for uh, two, three years that please remove him. In his uh, jurisdiction, there have been rumors that, the, uh, that uh, Imran Khan's wife's ex-husband has been sitting in the secretariat arranging people's transfers and postings in return for reward. So all of that is corrupt for God's sake, Huma Yusuf. Stop framing this as a binary. The major Pakistani political parties need to clean house. They need to end this acceptance of corruption. I fully agree with that. But this corruption narrative in Pakistan is overblown, exaggerated, and it is exaggerated primarily not to let Pakistan be a democracy. Is it, isn't there a certain headiness about the fact that, oh, finally you have an elected leader, may not have a majority, uh, but an elected leader who is now defying the army uh, and who is obviously not being supported by the army in what he's doing right now? First of all, it's not obvious. <coughs> Excuse me. The army has been neutral or at least appearing to be neutral doesn't mean that it has been uh, doing anything against Imran Khan. So this business, this narrative, somebody wrote a piece in the print, I saw that, that his defeat will be a defeat of Pakistan's dem uh, uh, democracy and a victory for generals. Again, oversimplification of narratives. Praveen Swami so wrote that, I'll let, you, let him know. Well, uh, don't, don't don't even bother because I think uh, he and I don't agree on most things about Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he has a rather naive uh, narrative about uh, about the country. Well, he's my uh, national security editor, so I'll have him speak with you at some point. But okay. nevertheless, let's carry on. He, he, look, the fact of the matter is that this is not a, this is nothing com compared to the past in terms of army's political interference. But even if there is, even if there is, it could be seen only maximally as a co co course correction. Did the army become weak politically under Imran Khan? No, it did not. 
It was inserted into things that it never used to be inserted into by other political leaders. Did it follow exactly what the army may have wanted for so many, uh, uh, for, for, for so long in his period in office? Imran Khan talked about uh, being on the same page. Now, if that page is torn, I don't think that that is in any way a victory of democracy over uh, the army or of the army over democracy. It's just a continuation of the same. It's more of the same with some differences. Bottom line is, can we actually get to a point where civilian governments can make decisions about foreign policy, about economic policy, about uh, 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 about major issues without having to worry about consequences of army and army defiance. Secondly, the way Imran Khan is being supported by retired military officers seems to suggest that those military officers who have a Ziaist worldview and those military officers who have a more Musharraf-like view, which are different, by the way, on certain things there is agreement, on his Ziaist and Musharraf. Yeah. The Musharraf's view being we need to be closer to the West, uh, not have an overdose of Islam in our life, etc. And the Ziaist view, which is use the West, but have an overdose of Islam in domestic life. Those two views, that th those two views are not on the same page. And so, is it possible that the more Islamist elements of retired military officers are supporting uh, 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 Imran, and that's what's giving him his uh, uh, self-confidence. Uh, that doesn't mean in any way the decline of the role of the army. Now, is it just the retired officers, or could this be this? Could this also re what retired officers are saying could reflect a split also in the army leadership? Well, look, the Pakistan army is too too uh, disciplined to have a split split. But, but are there different perspectives? I think the army reflects the society and Pakistan is a polarized society. Well, I mean, and, this, and this polarization is going to affect Pakistan for a very, very long time, continue to. People who have this, people who see Pakistan as a, you know, a great power that's just not flexing its muscles. People who think solving Kashmir comes before everything else. People who think that having these jihadis is not such a big deal. And people who think these are the things that are holding Pakistan back. Uh, these are, these, this is a division in Pakistani society that runs very deep. Democracy, uh, Pakistan has more fault lines than sometimes people who see everything in binary terms uh, 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 explain or understand. Look, there is the fault line, the, the fault line between our various regions uh, and ethnic groups. There is the and nationalities. There is the fault lines of civil military. There is the fault line between radical Islamism and a more modern outlook. Uh, there is the fault line between those who want democracy and who want controlled system, whether it's controlled by Imran Khan or whether it's controlled by a military officer. Look, for those retired officers, and the reason why retired officers become uh, 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 important is because they are vocal. Serving officers can't speak. Now, are those retired officers connected to serving officers? I mean, that's for the, that's the job of the military to find out in itself. But the fact of the matter is that there is a divide in Pakistan between those who think that Pakistan should become a Sunni Iran, defiant of the West. The problem is they don't realize Pakistan does not have the oil reserves that Iran does or the gas reserves that Iran does. But they think that way. And that division, that division is across society. And so bridging it is going to take some effort. Now, I have always argued that the way to bridge it is by not having this simplistic narrative of one set of people are traitors, one set of people are patriots, one set of people are kafir, one set of people are Muslims, except that this is a nation of 200 million people in which not everybody will agree. Imran Khan did not get 
more than half the vote of the Pakistani people, he got a minority vote. He should have been more humble. Same goes for other politicians. Nobody right now has more than 50% support in the country. Pakistan should have, I won't say necessarily coalition governments, but cooperative governments. And then those governments should try and bring things on track, um, marginalize the extremist discourse. And that requires also some understanding of the perspective of the military. So, you know, you can't, you can't just turn around and make it an overly simplistic narrative and say, that's not true. That's not in Pakistan's interest. I'm interested in you saying uh, this dream of making Pakistan is Sunni Iran because, and you said Pakistan does not have oil and gas like Iran. Pakistan doesn't have caviar either. But more seriously, uh, no, we have good mangoes. Yeah, pa well, you can do the trade off, but a dollar for dollar. But nevertheless, seriously speaking, uh, Iran does not have the percentage of Sunnis in its population uh, that Pakistan has by way of the percentage of Shias in its population. And they are well integrated in Pakistan. So for Pakistan, uh, does people who believe in this, they don't see the consequences for Pakistan's unity, sectarian unity? Look, ideologues don't see consequences the way pragmatists do. In a way, I'm glad that there are at least some pragmatists in Pakistan's military leadership. I'm glad that there are some pragmatists in Pakistan's politics, whether somebody sees them as corrupt or not, whether somebody sees the military people as inherently, you know, anti-democratic. But I think Pakistan needs more and more people who are pragmatic. My book, Reimagining Pakistan, has been translated into Urdu with the title Hakikat Pasand Pakistan Kaisa. What would a pragmatic Pakistan be like? If, if, I, if, if I've got it right, it must be sitting somewhere behind me. Uh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. But my point is, my, and, and my point is that the country needs to reimagine itself. And the events of the last few days, if they prove anything, Shekhar, they prove that the reimagining has become more important and more necessary. Imran Khan has taken Pakistan back to a more Zwiaist era in which the discourse is unrealistic. It's unrealistic about Pakistan's capabilities as a country. It's unrealistic about Pakistan's people. It's unrealistic about Pakistan's various nationalities and their relationship with one another. Well, uh, how does this Islamic Islamism sound coming out of the mouth of Imran Khan? I won't go into that. I mean, the fact of the matter is I'm surprised at the people who believe it. I am not surprised at him doing it. I'm surprised at the people who believe it. Look, Ziaul Haq was uh, known to be a personally pious person, uh, Shekhar. Yeah. But Imran Khan's reputation was nothing like that before. And then he has had his pictures taken while praying, etc. A genuinely pious person doesn't do that. But if he's pious, God bless him. I am not going to comment on his personal piety or lack thereof. All I'm saying is in the 21st century, running countries on the basis of your personal religion, your religion should make you a good man to run a country. But if your religion makes you hate people, if your religion makes you angry with them, if your religion makes you intrigue the way he has done, that does not speak of a, uh, of a good individual or a good person. He has let Pakistan down by not allowing Pakistan to move into the 21st century in terms of its economic and political outlook. I've just spotted one of your books in my shelves. All of them are there. And this is... You know, this is Pakistan between mosque and military. So right now, military has been sidelined a little bit. So between mosque and populists, is it? Well, uh, Pakistan between mosque and military is actually a textbook now in universities in many, many countries. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I wish that those who have called me 
names and abuse me over it read it and understand it will give them a better understanding of pakistani history and it will also enable them to figure out how to come out of some of the problems that we have created for ourselves we all wish well for pakistan at least i do i hope that uh, we can, can come out of the mess but these recent events are not necessarily very encouraging shikhar imran khan misses you a lot he keeps mentioning you in every speech of his well i think imran khan has a kind of a fantasy notion about me i'm sitting in this library doing my work i write my relationship with pakistan is now more intellectual analytical uh, theoretical uh, i'm not involved in day to day pakistani politics but he somehow thinks that uh, you know if americans criticize him if the international media criticizes him it must be because of hussein akani i assure him it's not because of me it's because of what he does uh but i uh, i am grateful to him for all the attention he keeps my name alive uh, uh and uh, uh, the bottom line is i write i analyze i don't conspire something we have spoken about before but both countries india and pakistan had sort of similar starts in 1947 uh our founders also had many of their shared many similar notions uh mohammad ali jinnah was not is not somebody who had, who had imagined pakistan to be a mostly military run country or a pakistan in which there will be no prime minister for more than two decades where did pakistan go wrong where did it lose its way i think pakistan lost its lost its way when our early leaders decided to try and make it into an ideological state and to try and craft a narrative uh, since then everybody talks about by uh, saving pakistan of uh, uh, of 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 me, uh, me transforming pakistan into its uh, uh, its uh, 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 into its ideological pure form instead of what instead of uh, deciding very early we've created a country this is how we will run it even now i say that all those people who talk about it, it look ideological states hardly ever succeed Absolutely. China is China was an ideological state under Mao but today it's a pragmatic state as a pragmatic state it's succeeding it uh, it negotiates over everything with everyone um uh, Israel which uh, was a pragmatic state under Netanyahu tried to become a ideological state has had many many problems because of that but as a pragmatic state it was pretty successful won the war in 1960 or 48 in 1967 etc uh, and 1973 uh, and then uh, was prepared to uh, sign the camp david accords uh, now now if i may interrupt you has signed the abraham accords and has signed the abraham accords with the arab countries uh, the arab countries which have signed the A- uh, abraham accords are a classic example of pragmatic states look at the united arab emirates they say look we are we are muslim uh, we are uh, and observant muslims will observe their faith uh, to the best of their ability and will be facilitated but at the same time those who are not they will live their own way hindus can have a temple christians can have a church jews can have a synagogue these are pragmatic states so i think pakistan took a very wrong turn by becoming an ideological state and creating ideological fantasies and ideological obsessions instead of practical decisions about uh, that would make its people prosperous and its state uh, run according to law and constitution and and by overemphasizing its military Uh, I think that the military uh, has a role in every country, but I think yes, Pakistan became an overly militarized state. We ended up thinking that the military is somehow the solution of everything. Look, a soldier is trained to locate the enemy and liquidate the enemy, but you need civilians to make a decision on who is the enemy and what are other factors. that may restrain you from fighting the enemy uh, uh, uh clemenceau uh, used to say war is too serious a business to leave just to generals uh, the military is a very well trained institution it has its role it must get its due respect for that role but then when it transcends that role 
then it cannot make the kind of decisions that nations need. A nation needs economists, a nation needs political thinkers, a nation needs compromises. Lastly, every soldier is trained to think in black and white in terms of enemy, friend, friend or foe, you know, when in, in, in movies, you have that scene when somebody approaches a military camp, the guy puts out a gun and says, are you a friend or a foe? It's a very simple word. But politics is about compromise. General Bajwa recently said that, you know, these politicians, they fight in the morning and have a cup of tea in the evening. That's a good thing. It should happen. But uh, unfortunately, the over-militarization of our uh, culture, our culture, has resulted in Imran Khan being able to say during the conference motion, ye kufr or Islam ki jang this is a battle between uh, truth and untruth, between Islam and uh, un-Islam, between right and wrong. Politics is not about right and wrong. Politics is about two different opinions about how to run the country. So if you can countenance that and understand that politics is just about two different opinions of how to run the country, then you can figure out how to compromise on those two opinions also. But if it is all a battle of right and wrong and you are right and your enemy is wrong, then there will be no compromise. And nations without compromise end up having the kind of problems Pakistan is having. Two last questions before I let you go. I know you are much in demand uh, as a sane boy so, who makes sense of things instead of uh, either fulminating on one side or the other. Number one, this proposition that obviously Imran is putting forward to his Pakistani followers and is also trying to get more followers like that, that the West is evil. The West is now in one corner and the other corner is China and Russia. China is our iron brother. Now we, China and Russia are one strong group of iron brothers. And in the process, I've taken away India's most reliable friend also. And now see what impact this has, it, this has on the balance of power in this subcontinent. Do you, first of all, how do you assess that idea? And do you see it working? Because I'm saying this particularly because today Russian Foreign Ministry has issued a statement supporting Imran Khan's idea or insinuation that Americans are punishing him for having gone to meet Putin. Russia is a pariah state itself right now. China is barely maintaining relations with Russia. Russia and China are not 100% hand in glove. America is China's biggest export market. Uh, uh, European Union is the next. Japan is uh, another. Australia is another. Uh, China is not going yeah. to make the huge. China India is another. 70 huh? plus billion dollars of trade surplus with India. Yes. So China is not going to. Uh, uh, act, uh, uh, you know, in a manner in which for Russia's sake, it will jeopardize its economy. These block ideas, they emerge on Pakistani Twitter, on Pakistani social media, they are circulated in WhatsApp, they are fantasies. It's like when CPEC was being talked about, everybody in Pakistan was saying CPEC is a game changer, it will create the world, make Gawadar the world's biggest port, bigger than Hong Kong, bigger than Dubai. I looked at the statistics. Of course, Gwadar didn't have the capacity to compare with Dubai or Rome. But some people do that. And I don't know who these people are. Sometimes I think these are the... I, I, I sometimes wonder if it's Indian intelligence doing this to just make Pakistanis live in a fantasy world. But, <laughs> you, you, but, you, but you give too much credit to them. But, but, I suspect, but I suspect Indian intelligence, like all other intelligence in the world, is not that intelligent to do it. But the truth is, it's an absolute fantasy. Whoever does it. I mean, I was saying that as a joke, meaning it would be people who want to, uh, who have an interest in harming Pakistan that make Pakistanis believe this, this, this nonsense. Look, Pakistan is a medium power. It's a medium sized power. It has nuclear weapons, but its economy is too small. Russia has nothing to give to Pakistan in economic terms. China can, but again, China has its own conditions. Anybody who provides economic assistance would want something in return. Pakistan has to get its economic house in order. And this notion that somehow Pakistan can be part of a Russia, China, Pakistan bloc would, again, make Pakistan the smallest member of that bloc. So uh, if Imran Khan's goal is not to be the dominated by anyone, then that problem is not going to be solved. The way to not get dominated is to become independent and self-sufficient and have an economy that is viable and that is not dependent on others. If a rhetoric is 
the criteria, then Pakistan is already the world's most successful great nation. Particularly because it won, it, won the Cricket World Cup once. Um, again, as I said, I don't take much of an interest in cricket, which I think is one of my most intelligent decisions. But you know what? Uh, Sri Lanka also won the Cricket World Cup once. And nobody in Sri Lanka thinks that that makes them one of the most important and powerful nations in the world. Power and importance in the world comes from the size of your economy, the capabilities of your military, the ability to keep your word with other nations, uh, uh, the, 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 the respect that you earn from other nations. Those are the real criteria. It's time for Pakistanis to become pragmatic. I have spent a lifetime making these arguments. All I have got in return for that is abuse. But you know what? My heart is very satisfied that I have been saying the right thing, saying what is good for Pakistan. And finally, what are the stories of curled and jadu tona and burning of chickens? And Look, I have no evidence of it. I have no evidence of it. I don't know. I haven't been in Pakistan throughout. But whatever these stories are, they are very disturbing. The fact that a superstitious man is prime minister should be worrying for everyone. Uh, the fact that uh, there is some kind of belief in the occult, uh, in the name of spirituality, it's disturbing. Uh, Pakistan having a, a religious person as prime minister is not a bad thing. A prime minister, president, if they pray five times a day, if they observe their fast, if they turn to God more, it's, it, it's their personal choice. But the fact of the matter is that if the close associates of a leader say that he believes in the occult, and you must remember there were rumors about Reagan, Ronald Reagan at one point having his wife consult all kinds of soothsayers, etc. Well, we, and we had somebody called Chandra Swami who was floating, Margaret Thatcher also float, floating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so when you have those people, the people get upset. So in my case, it's one of those things whenever Pakistan has a government after Imran Khan, and there will be some day. I mean, he can't be, even if he succeeds this time, even if he wins the next election, someday he will stop being prime minister. Whenever that ends, there should be an inquiry on, into this occult influence on decision making, because nations must understand what went wrong. And if things have gone wrong, because somebody has been uh, sort of doing janu, jadu tona or some kind of count, you know, hisab kitab to figure out what should, how the state should be run. That is not a positive thing. But I, again, I will be honest and say, I really have no knowledge of it. This could all be rumor. This could all be falsehood. The subcontinent elite often likes to gossip and we should be careful about gossip. But there is nothing in common between, in fact, there is contradiction between puritanical Islam and occult. Absolutely. So, uh, your parting words of advice to, at this point, former Prime Minister Imran Khan? I would advise Imran Khan to actually go gracefully. And, you know, you've lost this match, win another, uh, to, in language that you understand. Um, don't polarize Pakistan. Don't, don't make this about uh, right and wrong and good and evil. Politics should be politics. If pol uh, normal politics requires compromises, you've made compromises in your life. You called Sheikh Rashid a man in, in, so incapable that you wouldn't make him a clerk, uh, a chaplasi, sorry. And then you made him interior minister. You supported uh, Chaudhary Parvez Elahi for chief minister even though you called him the biggest daku or biggest robber. Uh, you supported uh, Musharraf at one point before opposing him. Uh, you joined a opposition coalition with uh, Maulana Fazlur Rahman and all those people that you know. All of us make compromises when we are in political life. I'm not in political life anymore, thank God. But political life is about compromises. Don't denigrate compromise. Compromise is good. Learn to be compromising yourself. And let Pakistan learn to compromise instead of becoming a divided nation with everyone fighting each other. In short, in short learn politics. Absolutely. So that's why, Hussain, next time we meet, I'll give you a set of these. 
we make these mugs that say the print mugs that say because politics matters thank you what is governance and in any case what is democracy without politics politics is absolutely good. absolutely so thank you very much hussain uh, stay well and stay happy and i think we can be quite sure that we'll never be bored with news coming out of pakistan or from india for that matter the print of the cuff corporate partner au small finance bank in alliance with indraprastha polo hospitals airline partner spice jet Oh